I say my identity was like what my mom thought of me, that's it was 100% that. So the idea of pulling away, getting away, wasn't even, it wasn't even something that came into my mind. I would be completely lost. I would be nothing without her. Also, I had been fed that messaging my entire life of, you know, you're completely incompetent. You are not smart. You can't do anything without me. You need me. I'm the thing that keeps you from just completely being derailed and, uh, and a loose cannon. And that was definitely what kept me from getting away sooner. So my mom had cancer for the first time when I was two. Um, so I was always kind of aware of the fragility of her health and, um, and I think that played a part. I just had this this weight on me all the time of, well, she could, she could go at any time. It was just like the awareness of her death was always weighing on, on not just me, but the entire family, you know? And, and then her cancer recurred when uh, I was 18. That would have been exactly the time that I would have been like, fuck you, mom. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm leaving you. Where I would have started really just, I think, rebelling like full, yeah. like very intensely. But because of her cancer, then I felt kind of roped back in with that guilt and, and that obligation and um, just all those overwhelming feelings that come with the imminence of death. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two And now she's gonna break down It's a breakdown She's gonna break it down Hi, I'm Maya Bialik And I'm Jonathan Cohen Welcome to a Thursday edition of Bite Size Breakdown Now, this episode is a collection of the best, most concentrated awesome moments from our conversation with writer, director, actor, and singer Jeanette McCurdy This is a woman who does it all and Jonathan, talk about some of the things that people will get in this bite-sized, condensed, miniature breakdown. You're going to get vulnerability. <laughs> You're going to get insight. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing, but she, we were so moved by her reflective nature and just how she um, was exploring how her past has was impacting her and, and her patterns that we thought, wait a second, we got to revisit this. Also, she's recently had a book come out number one bestseller, uh, and based on her one, uh, her one woman show, her play. Yeah. The, the book play, I'm glad my mother died has gotten tremendous reception. She talks to us all about her relationship with her mom, all of the revelations that she experienced after her mother's passing. She talks about disordered eating. She talks about coping mechanisms and when she thought she was okay and how those were actually, you know, holding her back and how she began to realize, uh, that she needed to change. Please enjoy the best moments of our talk with Jeanette McCurdy. And don't forget to tune in on Tuesday for a brand new full episode of My Alex Breakdown. Enjoy. Break it down. When I was six, my mom put me uh, in, in acting. I think to kind of, you know, she, she wanted, she had good intentions, I think, at, at the core of it. She wanted me to have a better life than she had. She didn't have a, a very good one. It was a constant struggle financially, emotionally, mentally. And I think she thought uh, that, that acting was an easy, you know, kind of early way out to kind of ensure that I had success and a better path than she had. I see it as something different by kind of like 11 was the main uh, financial support for my family. And, you know, there were a lot of was a lot of pressure that came with that. And I think with that pressure came kind of my resentments toward that career and uh, frustrations with it, as well as kind of resentments that were brewing toward my mom that I didn't identify as resentments at the time because, um, because of how much I absolutely adored her and found like my entire, entire identity in her idea of me. Classic investment schema. For the first year, having people come up to me and, and recognize me felt it was a form of validation. You know, I had always been the homeschooled kind of weird Mormon kid on the outskirts who never quite fit in, who was always like more naive than everyone around me. And then it very quickly shifted. Uh, and I think a big part of that was how much more my mom responded to it positively, even as she saw what it was doing to me emotionally and how difficult it was for me to handle and how, I mean, I didn't want to go outside. I was already anxiously kind of wired. And then I just became constantly hypervigilant. I let, walked out of the house and I'd be like looking around and like, oh, is there paparazzi here? Is there somebody here who's going to recognize me? And what are they going to say? And what are they going to want? And what are they? It was really hellish. Probably a year and, and a half was like definitely when I had started resenting it. And then of course, my mom was all the more kind of into it and like, take the pictures, do the thing, do the whatever, like 
why don't you love this? Why aren't you grateful? You're so ungrateful. Why would you not? This is what everybody's dream. It's like, mm, this was your dream, not mine. When I say my identity was like what my mom thought of me, that's, it was a hundred percent that. So the idea of pulling away, getting away, wasn't even, it wasn't even something that came into my mind. I would be completely lost. I would be nothing without her. Also, I had been fed that messaging my entire life of, you know, you're completely incompetent. You are not smart. You can't do anything without me. You need me. I'm the thing that keeps you from just completely being derailed and, uh, and a loose cannon. And that was definitely what kept me from getting away sooner. So my mom had cancer for the first time when I was two. Um, so I was always kind of aware of the fragility of her health and, um, and I think that played a part. I just had this, this weight on me all the time of, well, she could, she could go at any time. It was just like the awareness of her death was always weighing on, on not just me, but the entire family, you know? And, and then her cancer recurred when uh, I was 18. That would have been exactly the time that I would have been like, fuck you, mom. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm leaving you where I would have started really just, I think rebelling like full, yeah. like, very intensely, but because of her cancer, then I felt kind of roped back in with that guilt and, and that obligation and, um, just all those overwhelming feelings that come with the imminence of death. My mom was the person who introduced me to anorexia. Actually, I had a, a lump in my breast, which was my boob developing. Uh, and I was scared that it was cancer because of my mom's cancer. I thought, oh, she got cancer. Now I've got cancer. I'm going to, I've got breast cancer at 11. Like I'm doomed. And I told her and she said, you don't have breast cancer. You're just developing boobs. I said, well, how can I not develop boobs? I don't want those. And she said, well, there's a thing called calorie restriction. Those were exact words. She did not say the word anorexia. I did not hear the word anorexia until I overheard a doctor talking with my mom a year later when I had lost X amount of weight and was real thin. And it sounded like a dinosaur to me. I remember that distinctly thinking like, hmm, somebody's talking about me like I'm a dinosaur about my eating disorder, which my mom denied in order for her to be able to support it. All pieces of the puzzle that I've kind of put together later in life didn't realize at the time. I just thought, well, mom's looking out for me. Mom wants me to not have breasts so that I don't have breast cancer. Mom wants me to be, look young so I can book more roles so I can support the family. My mom passed away when I was 21. That same week was the first time that I had sex the first time that I made myself throw up bulimia, which I had for then years, a few years. Uh, and the first time that I had a drink of alcohol. So I think there's no denying that it was, you know, mom death and those coping mechanisms all kind of hit at once. Post my mother's death. Um, I had found out some things about her that, threw me for a loop that completely derailed what my image of her was and the pedestal that I had had her on definitely drove me more to my coping mechanisms. Things kind of definitely got worse before they got better. Literally any, any time that I wasn't purging, I was thinking about my next time purging. That was how my mind was just oriented. I was doing it five to 10 times a day when my sister-in-law was staying there and she goes, this has to stop. Like we have to find a way to get you help. I can't stand by and watch somebody that I love uh, hurt themselves like this. This is really not okay. It took so much courage from her, like it makes me emotional. It took so much courage from her to say that and to 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 do that. And I really appreciate it. I think that was really the turning point for me. And and also knowing knowing that somebody else knew it was like oh the secret's out. I actually found out later on after kind of coming you know speaking publicly about it. I I had gotten some emails from people that would be like. Yeah, I found some like residue on my toilet seat, uh, just so you know, which then I was like, oh God, honestly, it was more just like humiliation because I thought that I was like this gifted secret keeper and I like wasn't good at that. That was like pretty much all I had during that time was hoping and clinging to the fact that maybe, you know, my shame was my own, but knowing that like, eh, you actually weren't pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. That was, uh, that was a bummer. I think I was acting as much, if not more in my regular life to my mom, to the people around me as I was in front of the camera. It was just 100% across the board of facade, which is why ultimately I had to step away because I felt like it was just too damaging to my mental health, to my greater good. My Bialx Breakdown is supported by Earth Breeze. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in massive plastic jugs? Who wants that? I wonder this all the time. 91% of those inconvenient, awkward, heavy jugs end up in landfills and oceans harming our planet and marine life. There has to be a better way. Well, guess what? There is. Do what I did. Switch to Earth Breeze. 
Earth Breeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. It's a revolutionary liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold, no measuring, no mess, and no ridiculously heavy plastic jugs. You just toss the sheet in, it's that easy. Earth Breeze has really made the whole concept of detergent so much better. The packaging is lightweight, biodegradable, and plastic-free. It's even great for sensitive skin, which I have. Their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested. Earth Breeze is compatible with high efficiency washers, gray water systems, and it's also septic safe. They offer flexible subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled by you at any time. No contract, no fees. It's delivered right to your door via free carbon neutral shipping at a frequency you can set that works for your unique lifestyle. Most importantly, this is what my children always ask about detergent. It will get things clean. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and your clothes will come out clean every time. Don't just take my word for it. Try it for yourself with their risk-free 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, Earth Breeze will give you a full refund. No questions asked, no return necessary. Switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash breakdown to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash breakdown for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash breakdown. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. I use Athletic Greens every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I'm a super busy person who doesn't want to take a million pills to fill all the holes in my diet that come about because I'm a super busy person. So what is Athletic Greens? Well, one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens gives you 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's a special blend of ingredients to support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, recovery, focus, everything. It's lifestyle friendly, which is one of the things I love most about it. So if you eat keto or paleo or vegan, maybe you're dairy-free or gluten-free, it's for you. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, and it tastes good. AG1 is a micro habit with macro benefits. It's something you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. One scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I think a, a huge factor in helping me uh, identify, I think what, what I actually want and, and the life that actually means something to me versus other people was a type of therapy, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, physical concrete worksheets, which was the key factor in why I liked DBT, why I preferred it over other types of therapies. I felt like talking was getting me nowhere. I don't want to just talk in circles and not get anywhere. I want like a paper to tell me where I'm at. Uh, it really helps me to feel kind of more centered and grounded. And this type of therapy did that for me. And it, and, and a big part of it is identifying your life worth living. And, and with that comes uh, locking down kind of your values and goals that actually mean something to you and having those um, parts of life really kind of nailed down and pinned down in concrete ways was, was hugely helpful to me. And of course it changes. It's not like, you know, just because I had a goal when I first created my goals that I'm going to like keep that for my life or something like that. But, um, it really helped me a lot. You wrote a play, correct? Uh, yeah. A, a one woman show. It's just like a cringy term. <laughs> My relationship with my mom is something that I'll be working through for sure for, for, you know, for a long time to come and like exploring, I think in some form of art for a long time, I have to feel a personal investment to the things that I'm writing. I admire people who don't have to have that personal investment and can just kind of like latch onto characters or a story and go to town. I'm sure it comes from a place of selfishness. I just have to feel like, oh, what am I exploring? That's, you know, relevant to me and helping me work through something Or I feel like I, I can sense that sense, like that lack of personal investment. Uh, I took some time off and then I wrote a one woman show, just kind of explores my relationship with my mom from childhood up until a few years after her passing, kind of the revelations that I had in post her passing that helped me to find my own identity and establish my own identity. And I think the tagline was something like, you know, how my mother dying turned out to be the greatest. What was it? How did you say it? The show is called I'm Glad My Mom Died. How my mom's death went from being the worst thing that ever happened to me to the best. That was, yeah, I just, I really love that. I've been writing a book for, that was based on the one woman show. I just think a book has the amount of space necessary totally. to kind of cover the ground that I want to cover and the way that I want to cover it. 
uh, entirely. So that's been incredibly fulfilling. I, I'm a very kind of career motivated person. I don't think, I don't want to go back in front of the camera. I don't see that happening for me. Um, I'd love to kind of direct things that I didn't write at some point, things that I just kind of connect with. This is the journey. Like this is life. And I just, um, I love all the parts of it that you have seized and, um, also think it's really, really amazing that through your struggles, you've been able to create so much, you know, it's really beautiful. Thank you for joining us for this very special Thursday episode of Mind Bialik's Breakdown. If you like what you hear, please rate us, review us, and make sure to follow us on Instagram at Bialik Breakdown to tell us your favorite parts of this episode. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Mind Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's going to break down.